And when you enter a turf trial, it, it is really important that you send good quality seed. Uh, this particular plot was infested with annual ryegrass. You can see that the uniformity is really poor. Yeah. The mowing quality is really poor. But this is this kind of things that your homeowners get with certain companies that they sell uh, and they'll put in an annual ryegrass as a filler in there. It does help with establishment, but for your first year uh, and going into your second year, you really have an ugly turf. Yeah. This is Kentucky 31. Yep. It is the most popular uh, tall fescue out on the market, hands down. There's more seed sold of it than anything else. Uh, it has, Sad. do you know why it gets its name <laughs> Kentucky 31? I don't. It was developed at the University of Kentucky and released in 1931. Okay. We haven't done any breeding work in it. Um, it's just Kentucky 31, it's a released variety. But we've gone from this to what you see around it. Um, in, and this is a really good plot of Kentucky 31. Usually it's not this dense. So you can see that the advancements that we have made in breeding mm -hmm. over time. Kentucky 31 obviously is down at the bottom for green cover, for density, uh, and also for drought. It, it's in the middle of the pack. This has always been the drought standard. Uh, but a, a turf grass like you see around it, which is denser, darker green, um, outperforms Kentucky 31 in terms of uh, That is interesting because I think a lot of people have that, oh well that's just the best one. It might not look that good but it's going to be the right. best. Right yeah. and I mean you could, this was mown yesterday. You can already see that uh, it needs to be mown again today yeah. uh, where the the other uh, plots around you. And it is, doesn't cut all that great sometimes. It, correct. So we're mowing this uh, three times a week um, with a real mower. Um, but because of it, uh, <clears throat> its rapid extension rate, yeah. it, we don't always get a nice clean cut on it. It's a pasture grass that has found a way into turf. Uh, yeah. uh, that's, and it has good survival. I mean, it can take a beating though, and it, yeah. it does survive, and that's one of But when you talk about a homeowner wanting to plant that, they got to understand what their goals are. It, right. Is their goal to mow once every week and it looks just okay and yeah, it survives? Or if you are someone who wants a higher standard, why don't we start with a better product that can have less input and still has great drought tolerance, still has great survivability. So we need to really understand what our goals are before we go into anything. Are we going for something that I don't really have to take much care of and I don't really care about? Sure, that might be a good fit. But if you have a higher standard, let's look at some improved cultivars and start pushing into um, being more responsible with TWCA and our water usage and our fertility. Right. That's the direction we need to be heading. Not, let's see how fine and dark we can get and all of that, that can come. Let's look at the whole picture of the turf. Let's look at the whole picture of the variety. That's where I think a lot of people miss. So in here, um, in these tubes, we are selecting for both drought and heat. Just because something is drought tolerant does not make it heat tolerant. It's a big focus for looking at lower inputs um, as far as water and um, other types of inputs that we're looking at. But as, as water becomes a more precious resource uh, and as temperatures are increasing um, in our areas, uh, that greatly affects how turf is going to stay in our landscape. And Jack mentioned a lot about um, the benefits of turf. And if you look at the natural landscape, grasses occupy so much of that space. And yes, it's not mown, but they're still, they're still in those spaces. Uh, we need to keep grass um, in our, around our homes for water infiltration, cooling effects. And to do that, we have to make sure that we're building those cultivars to meet those environmental needs. It takes time. Like I mentioned earlier, we started drought work in the early 90s. Those are now really hitting the market on a very uh, strong uh, percentage. That's some time span. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Um, so we're doing the same in here with drought and heat because we need to be able to couple both of those. We can select something that is heat tolerant, but it's not drought necessarily drought tolerant. And the same thing with drought. Um, so we want to be able to make sure that we get that full package together. So we can do that in here. 
Um, we came from outside. It was actually fairly cool and pleasant out there. We stepped in here. It's yeah. very warm. Yeah. Uh, this is not a heated greenhouse, but be, it's uh, enclosed. So in a summer, in our typical summers, we reach about 140 degrees in here. And what makes that really special is in, in the selection process, you can see these tubes. So you've got your grasses up on the top, and this is one plant in each of these tubes, and it's just grown. Uh, but we also have the roots. So in a natural s selection or setting, the roots are not exposed to those high temperatures. In here they are. That's unusual. So we are selecting for plants that can survive with those type of stresses implied upon them. And we don't get very many survivors. There's 180 tubes per section. And we have five different sections in here. We'll let these dry down and heat up. And in here we'll take about uh, maybe 10, five to 10 plants per 180. And so that's, that's not a lot, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay? When you buy a bag of seed, uh, you've got a cultivar. It's a population, okay? So you get a distribution. It's not till we get to single plants that we can start selecting at the uh, far right of that curve and take our top, top individuals out of that population, okay? Um, we can do that in here. When I say we're gonna remove five of these plants, uh, roughly, then we move those together. That becomes our new crossing population. We'll cross those plants, harvest the seed off of those plants, and then we're gonna take those, that seed to the next cycle of selection. And it can be that we bring them back in here again, and we select them again for heat. We're starting to narrow down our, our curve. So instead of having a very wide bell-shaped curve, we, get, we narrow that down. We have to be careful <laughs> because we talked about our other attributes. Right. Yield, turf quality, disease resistance. Um, so we have to keep cycling in those avenues as well so that um, we don't lose that. So we'll select these four. We've got our five individuals. We've harvested that seed. We bring them in here. We'll select again. We'll maybe, let's say we'll take 10. We take those 10, harvest the seed, then we'll go trial it in turf and for um, disease pressure. So we'll take it to the East Coast where we get a lot of just summer stress. So it's in now it's in a turf plot. We'll go into that turf plot and there'll just be little patches of green. We're gonna remove those, okay? They're not single plants, so we're removing portions of that population. And we'll bring those back, increase the seed off of it. Then we may bring it back here and select again for individuals, or we may go to what we call a plant selection field. So now we're gonna look at 500 plants of that population. And then again, we'll evaluate them for uh, crown density, uh, seed yield potential, um, production diseases like stem rust and crown rust, um, because we have to get that production element back in. And then out of that 500 plants, we may select 15. It, it just keeps going in that type of a cycle. So um, until we get to a point when we take it back to a turf trial, that now for summer stress in say New Jersey, we have a perfect stand. You know, it gets very little disease. We put it into a drought trial. Um, it's very drought tolerant and very green. Then we're going, okay, this is ready to be released and then we'll put it into the yield trials like you saw earlier. Okay, it's acceptable for yield. We'll see if somebody yeah. wants to take it to market. What a process. It, yeah. It's a long process. So yeah. when you say you're selecting like five plants out of here and uh -huh. you're crossing them, are you yep. crossing to get genetics into one place or are you trying to? Okay, so when we mean? cross them, so we're letting the five individual plants pollen, interpollinate. So the pollen from... Okay. Uh, all five plants just gets all mixed up. So it's not necessarily trying to create a blend of, I have these five seeds in this blend. It's no. You're trying to get into one. Yes, I'm so I'm, I'm diversing, crossed. diversifying the, the, the pollen and the, of the genetics in, in that population. Right. Got it. Yeah. Makes sense. Wow. Yeah. No, you can see, so these uh, have been drying down, and this is again perennial ryegrass, so they're going to dry a little faster um, than a tall fescue in here. But you can see that uh, this population um, 
you know, some of these plants are really starting to hurt. They've been in this today, well, today is the 22nd, so 22 days of dry down. You know, you can look at the different populations in here. The first population that we came to, you know, some of these in here are still very green. They still look really good, where some of these are really starting to uh, crisp down. Mm -hmm. A plant that is going to stay really green, um, it's healthy and it was growing, Th those roots probably are near the bottom of this too. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I'm five foot tall, so, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like three that's, feet. No, that's one of, the, one of the things that a lot of breeders really forget. Um, we always focus, because that's what we see, we see the top. So we don't focus on what's underneath. And Chase was talking earlier about uh, perennial ryegrass not persisting in the production fields past two years. So in, unless you focus on improving what's underneath, mm -hmm. um, then you you don't get some of that uh, longevity in those stands. Let's give a shout out to Jimmy Fox, uh, <laughs> Roots Before Shoots. I think that's what he said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I hope you learned a lot in this video. I know I learned a ton on this portion of the trip. Next up, we're gonna be going to an actual grass seed grower and talk about kind of their methods and then how things go through a facility and get cleaned and all of that stuff. That is coming up on the next part of the trip. Thanks so much for watching today. We'll see you next time.